I'm just cleaning up all the dirt here. There's no dirt here at the Resurrection Center. Oh, hi. I didn't know you came in. Have a seat. We're going to be talking about some dirt today. I was just cleaning up here and just to make sure that there wasn't any dirt. I'll give uh, my feather duster to my beautiful wife. This is a different lesson today. We're going to talk about dirt. We're going to talk about something filthy. We're going to talk about something ugly. We're going to really get into it. And the dirt that I'm talking about today is greed. Greed is the doorstep to death. I'll say that again. Greed is the doorstep to death. That's what we're talking about today. My name is David Ewan. I head up the Braveheart Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastor Jose and Pastor Melly at the Resurrection Center. We're located at 1060 Worcester Street in Springfield, Massachusetts. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TRC413, and subscribe to us at Red Sand Spring on YouTube. We're also on uh, the radio, uh, K Radio. We're also on Resurrection Center Radio. Dot com. We're also on ktv.us. I'll put it on Facebook. We're, we have four websites. I'll get that for you. Um, so the first thing I want to do is take a moment about take announcement for you. Here's an announcement. We have a brave-hearted men's ministry extravaganza. Ooh, wow, what a nice name. I'll tell you what the title is. It's Your Identity is Your God-Given Purpose. Your identity is your God-given purpose. It's Friday, September 18th, 2020, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pastor Milley says, I'm going to jump over the fence and sneak into this men's meeting. Right. Pastor Milley, there's no fence. You just come in the door. My wife says, I'm too short to jump over a fence. Honey, I'm driving. You just come with, I'll hold open the door for you. Emily says, I'm not jumping any fence. There's no fence. So the ladies are invited. Friday, September 18th, 2020, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., your identity is your God-given purpose. I'll talk about that fence a little bit later. Today, we're going to talk about error and greed. The title of our conversation, that's what I'm going to have with you. I'm going to have a little conversation because we're going to get deep tonight. So what's going to happen tonight, we're going to talk about, as I said before, greed is the doorstep to death. Honey, they don't believe me. They don't believe me. Greed is the doorstep to death. Listen, take the laundry off the sofa and sit down. We're going to talk tonight. This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about something that I lived through. We're going to be talking about death with greed. I'm going to show that to you. So... We're going to talk about 1st of Timothy. We're going to focus on uh, chapter 6, which is the last chapter in 1st of Timothy. Uh, we'll understand greed. We'll understand the pitfalls and the riches that come with that. Uh, three things about false teachings. We'll talk about false teachers causing division. Division. That's, that's another tragedy there, division. False teachers are victims of greed. That's why we have false teachers. They're, we're victims of greed. The issues of greed, what is greed? It's idolatry because it takes your mind off the prize. What's the prize? Salvation. What's salvation? Heaven. It's God. So we're going to talk about repentance for correction. So let me tell you more about this fence, okay? It's a story, but I'm going to tell you the story because it illustrates a point, Okay? A while ago, if you've been with the church for a while, the pastor talked about a fence. Pastor Melly doesn't want to jump over a fence. My beautiful wife says, I'm too short to jump over the fence. Emily absolutely won't jump over the fence. But pastor, he wants a fence. If pastor wants a fence, we're going to have a fence. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are four people involved with putting this fence together. See, we have our youth minister over here, Chris O'Brien. He's a homeowner. So he knows about fences. He knows about building things. And then, of course, we have Minister Wayne LaPointe. You may have heard me call him Bunker Bob because he's amazing with tools. He's got all the tools. And then you have me. I've been a businessman for 
more than 26 years, and so I know how to talk about money. And then we have pastor. Pastor's good. He knows how to ask questions. So those are the four people. So here's the deal. So pastor talks with us individually. He talks first with Chris, then he talks with Wayne, then he talks with me, okay? So the first thing he asks Chris is, Chris, I want to put a fence out there. I say, why are you putting a fence out there? Oh, never mind. Don't, just don't tell Pastor Millie. I want a fence out there. <laughs> so we put a fence out there. And he said, how much is it going to cost? So what does Chris say? Chris says, Chris says he, he gets out the tape measure. He's writing down figures. And then he says, he says, I can do it for $900. $400 parts, $400 labor, and I'll get $100 profit. All right, $100 profit. That's all right. But pastor likes to ask questions. So he wants a second opinion. So what does he do? He goes to Minister Wayne LaPointe. Minister Wayne LaPointe, he's, you know, I told you he's Bunker Bob. He knows all about tools. So there's, there's uh, Wayne. He's got this wonderful tape measure. This, it's made out of gold and diamonds. This is an amazing thing. And, and then what he's got, he, he, he figures it out. He writes it down and says, I can do it not for 900 I can do it for $700. So really, seven hundred dollars? Yeah, three hundred dollars parts, three hundred dollar labor, and I'll just get a hundred dollars. Same as Chris, a hundred dollars profit for him. That's good. Save two hundred bucks. But once again, Pastor likes to ask questions, so he still has to ask me. He says, Dave, how much will the fence cost? I don't pull out a tape measure. I don't write down figures. I say, two thousand seven hundred dollars. pastor looks at me and says, what do you mean $2,700? So you see, it's easy, pastor. You get 1000 I get 1000 and we'll pay Bunker Bob $700 to build a fence. <laughs> so that's why pastor doesn't ask me questions. But what happens is, the point is this, the point is this, is that we live in a world of manipulation. I, I, I gave a funny joke, but we live in a world of manipulation uh, and deception where people will try to get an advantage over someone else, okay? So let's get diving into the dirt of greed. What is greed in the year 2020? What does it mean today? What's 20? So let's talk about what it is. Everyone wants it all. Why do they want it all? Because they feel empty. Why? Because they haven't sought the Lord. They feel empty inside. So they'll be compulsive buyers. They'll shop, 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 shop. They want the biggest thing. They want the fanciest thing. Number two, they're living in excess beyond what they can handle. They make a certain amount, but they'll live a lifestyle beyond their means. Other people, when they get to that point, they'll break the law. They also avoid generosity. If you feel wealthy, you'll give to others. But those who are in greed will not be giving. They forget others, including family. They gamble. It was a crying shame that we had the MGM Casino come here a couple years ago. Um, they take unnecessary risks. First of Timothy chapter 6, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. First of Timothy chapter 6 warns us against greed that destroys us. As I said before, greed is the doorstep to death. It's the doorstep to death. And the problem is that the false teachers in the false churches promote greed. First of Timothy is one of Paul's three pastoral epistles. What's a pistol? It's not an email. It's a letter. Okay, let's talk about epistles. Let's, let me give you a little education on epistles. What are these letters, okay? First of Timothy, second of Timothy, and Titus are written to specific people whom the Apostle Paul was advising how, on how to lead the churches. When we read these letters, we learn how an apostle back in the day was instructing the, how the churches should be run today. Many ch uh, churches forget that especially the false ones. See, these three letters present a close look at the form and function of church leadership. Church leadership. 
Paul's other letters, such as the Romans and the Ephesians and Colossians, all the others, that's meant for a broader uh, audience. So why am I telling you this? Today, I'm going to be talking about a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about church leadership. And the specific topic is about error and greed. So the book of First of Timothy, the book of First of Timothy is full of very practical advice from Timothy's mentor, the Apostle Paul. We've been talking about it. We, we've, we've already covered uh, First of Timothy, uh, chapter 1, uh, all the way th- through chapter 5. Last week we had a summary. Chapter 6 rounds out the instructions given in the first five chapters because it's sort of the conclusion. Okay, Building on the ideas laid down earlier in the letter, the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy of the importance of godly living and avoiding the snares of evil. So easy to get caught up in it. What are the snares of evil? It's the temptation. We get caught up in temptation. We live in in a world of temptation. This chapter provides a strong encouragement for Timothy to apply the wisdom of this letter. See, that's the idea. If you, if you look at this letter, when you read 1st of Timothy, and also 2nd of Timothy for that matter, that, that was done years later. You'll see it's written to a more mature church leader. So 1st of Timothy, I like that one better because the Apostle Paul is speaking to a new church leader, and he's instructing the new ch- church leader how to operate the church. See, that's what an apostle does, okay? 2nd of Timothy is talking is the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy after he's had some experience? So it's got a little bit more meat. But for the first of Timothy, it's really fun to read because it look if you you could really read first of Timothy, walk into a church and say, "Yep, that's right. Nope, that's not working." So, so building on the ideas laid down in the letter, Paul the Apostle Paul reminds Timothy of the importance of godly living, as I said. So. Let's do a quick review in a nutshell, T- 20 seconds. First of Timothy, the first six chapters, okay? Number one, first uh, chapter, Paul's philosophy of the ministry. That was a great introduction. Number two, uh, pray for leaders and godly women. The third chapter, overseers, deacons, and the conduct in the church. More of the church leadership. That's what we talked about in chapter three. Number uh, four, Chapter 4, it was the departure from the faith. Remember we talked about the apostasy? Okay. Um, And it's to train for a more godliness way of thinking. And number 5, chapter 5, was uh, to respectfully challenge uh, the leadership. Today, we're going to discuss greed and the error that comes from greed. But my focus tonight is to let you know that greed is the doorstep to death. And why do I know that? Because I was standing on it. And I'm going to share a testimony later on. So we'll talk about how greed has caused error in the doctrines that we teach from the false teachers. That means greed is the factory. It's the manufacturer of false teachings in the church. Greed is a distraction, just like idolatry is a distraction. That is why greed is idolatry. It's a sin. Say idolatry. You just said greed. It's the same thing. Today we talk about how greed equals idolatry and how idolatry is the factory, the manufacturer of false doctrine being taught in many churches today. You're probably wondering, you look around, which churches? I'll tell you which ones. The ones that are closing, that's which ones. Yep, those are the ones. All right. Here's my testimony. I'm going to tell you what greed is. I'm going to tell you the world that I grew up in. Picture 1963 Boston. A wealthy neighborhood. That was uh, where I grew up. And I remember in 1970, at seven years old, I was born in 63, I was drilled the message when I was seven years old. At 20 years old, I need to be making $40,000 at 20 years old. At 30 years old, I need to be making $60,000. At 40 years old, I need to be making $80,000. I was being told this in 1970. Let me go a step further. 
a dollar in 1970 is equivalent to six dollars and 68 cents today. So now I'll tell you what he was telling me so that you can relate the numbers to today's numbers. At 20 years old, you need to be making $267,000. At 30 years old, you need to be making $400,000. At 40 years old, you need to be making $534,000. That was programmed into my head when I was seven years old. What do seven years old uh, kids do? They obey. They listen. They receive. I absorb that. I'm 57 years old. I do not make a million dollars. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So the struggle, you know the dream to buy a first home? The struggle to buy a, a first home back then was real. You know, we didn't have the issues that caused the housing bubble in more recent years. What was required back then was you need to have 40% cash. When I say cash, I mean cash down payment on a $150,000 home. Okay? In a dollar in 1980 is equivalent in purchasing power to about $3.14 today. So in today's dollar, you need to have $190,000 cash down for a $470,000 home. It's a little bit different in Boston. And you're paying off university education and loans for both a bachelor's and a master's degree. That was typical back then. So you had college debt, and you're struggling for the dream because that's what you're programmed for. So it was all about money. You had debt. I mean, that's natural. You know, a, a four-year degree, a master's degree, which is typical in, in that area. And then you have to go for the dream. So the struggle was definitely real. For me... I was 24 years old when I got my master's degree. I needed a half a million dollars for the dream. That was the life in the 1980s. Boston was a factory of greed in the banking and investment industry. I worked at corporate headquarters at Baybank Systems Incorporated in Waltham and Putnam Investments in Quincy. I was working on managing and protecting $387 billion of other people's money. So not only was there the struggle to make the money, but you're also protecting billions of dollars of other people's money. So I was just surrounded by just money, 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 money. So I was programmed that way. Um, some of you know that my father was a famous scientist in history. He has a PhD from Harvard University. I won't go through the details. Google it. Doc Ewan. It's all, all over. Um, all, of our, all of his sons wanted to be like dad. That's what we, we knew. It's all about money, prestige, and status. We were not told that was wrong. We were told to go forward with money, prestige, and status. The colloquial phrase, no money, no honey. I was taught that money built happiness. I believe money made things to be possible. Now, as an educator for over 30 years, 32 years, I, I believe in education. Um, so I understand that in education, what was programmed into me, that it would provide a higher paying job. It would provide a future and an opportunity. Okay, I still accept that today. Uh, then there was the whole idea of title to prestige. That's the nose up in the air. Material things, status, you know, the big show off. Let me tell you, Jeremiah 29, 11. Pastor, you know that's my favorite. He knows that's my favorite scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Let me tell you, it's all we need. We don't need prestige and status. Instead of buying a house, see, I was single, I built a publishing company in Natick, Massachusetts. Some of you know that I've been a business owner. It's, we've passed our 26th anniversary, been around for a long time. Uh, created the New England Publishers Association, which runs today. Back then, it was 300 members. It's much more today. I sold it in 2000. Um, I had commercial properties. I had three of them. I had commercial properties in Natick, Framingham, and Westboro. Uh, we didn't have offices. We had command centers. We moved uh, to our command center from Framingham to a much bigger facility in Westboro. Um, in 1998, I was a touring professor, big man on campus. It was all about prestige and status. I was on that train. 
I was on, on that train. It was just focus, focus, focus. And I remember waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning, working on my business. Then I'd work at the corporate headquarters. I was doing both. Um, and then I would go back to my own office after I w worked in software development during the day and worked in my office till about 10 o'clock at night. And then the next morning, wake up at 4 o'clock. It's amazing what you can do when you're young. Okay? We talk about the factory of greed. We talk about the factory of greed. Um, you know that kind of lifestyle couldn't last forever. No, no. See, I trusted the wrong people. I was deceived and manipulated by selfish people. S see, when you get up to the top of that mountain, they're going to knock you down. I wasn't walking with the Lord. I missed it. I totally missed it. If I knew what I know now, not just being older, more mature, but more importantly, if I was walking with the Lord, that wouldn't have happened. I got knocked off my perch. I, did, I was deceived and manipulated by selfish people, and I didn't see it coming. I put money in the wrong places. I was under the influence of jealous people who are intimidated and afraid of my success. They were intimidated that I would overpower them. They were afraid that I would make them look bad. Um, I'm a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. But that hard work was very powerful back then. The, the type of people I was surrounded by in the world of greed were, were those that had the following type of actions. It was deception, manipulation, selfishness. I was surrounded by those type of actions. The type of behavior of the people that were around me was related to jealousy, intimidation, and fear. They stole my identity and they stole my destination for success. They took it away. So what happened? I don't know who was here in the February 20th men's meeting. Pastor Melly, did you jump over that fence? No. Um, <laughs> there's no fence. For those that might have been here, I was... <laughs> Bunker Bob over here. I fell into dep depression. I sucked up the alcohol, and I was chewing down the sleeping pills. And that's because I really felt empty, because I was running on the greed. I was running on the greed. Think of that, sleeping pills, alcohol. Many times, many, I've lost count the number of times of uh, near accidental suicide. I wouldn't say it was intentional, but it was a situation where I didn't care. So if you're at a point that you don't care, then you don't care whether you're going to heaven or not. You don't care whether you live or die. That is why I said greed is the doorstep to death. Why? Because I was standing on it. I was homeless. I was homeless. It wasn't long. It was for a week. But I was sleeping on the floor of the command center at UN Prime Company at Westboro, Massachusetts. It was cold at night because we powered down the facility at night. It was cold. It was a hard floor. You know, the feeling of homelessness. The homelessness is, it's just a constant fear. It's kind of like if, if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to ride roller coasters because it's too scary when you go up and you're falling, and that's what it feels like, even though you're sleeping on the floor of the command center, you have that feeling that you're falling, and you don't know where that fall, and you don't know when that falling is going to stop. I did not go to AA meetings. I should, probably should have, but I didn't go to AA meetings because I was too drunk to go. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. AA meetings, forget about it. <laughs> so let me tell you three words. Addiction, suicide, homelessness. That's the doorstep to death. 
That is what changed me. Now, I said that's what changed me. Here's the interesting thing. God puts a voice in you, whether you're following him or not, because God is seeking you. We have a free will. I could have continued to go astray, or I could have made the choice to figure out how to recover. To this very day, my wife still asks me details about it. And I, I don't know. I mean, I know God was involved, and I know decisions were made, but I knew that I did not have the power to make the right decisions because I was totally released from life. I gave up. When you give up on life, you don't make the choice to move forward. It, once you've already let go of that rope and it's gone, it's like if you've ever gone water skiing, and, and there you are water skiing, and then, you know, the boat jerks forward and you lose the rope, and it's gone. Oh, that's it. It's gone. That's what I felt with life. The, the speedboat was gone. Life was going, and I was sinking in the water. That's what I felt like. Okay? If that doesn't humble you, if that doesn't humble you and make you seek God, then you are a servant to Satan. And maybe that's why I changed. I take a moment to share that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. And then later, you, later, I met me, me cosita Linda. Everyone go, ah. Oh. Now, I've already shared with you the environment that I grew up in. Um, Marie and I, were working on the story. The book's coming out. Well, you know, the, the story. But uh, can you imagine, can you imagine at a family reunion? Now, I've already explained the environment I grew up in. So imagine July of 2002. It's hot out, right? And, and I would say, I, I met her three months ago. Uh, she's illegal, and she doesn't speak English. <laughs> you laugh. It's true. It's true. Jane. God bless her. But it's true. I met her in 2002. Think of this. Think of this. Let me, let me paint the picture of, of the environment that I was in. I met my wife in March 30th of 2002. And I made that statement. I met her three months ago. She's illegal and she doesn't speak English. That was six months after 9-11. Can you imagine? So when I'm introducing my wife, my girlfriend at the time, we weren't even engaged. My girlfriend at the time, who I knew for like 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go well. That didn't go well. Now, that was in July. One month later in August, on my birthday, as a surprise to her, I asked her to marry me. That was August, so it's a few days ago. We just celebrated an 18th anniversary. So a month later, I'm saying, yeah, I'm going to marry her in two months. We got married in October. So this did not go very well in the environment. But let me tell you, this is how powerful God is. After being homeless, addicted, drunk, I was being delivered. I didn't care about the gossip. Whatever they said, forget about it. <laughs> the gossip, the jealousy, and the immaturity start to fly as high as an eagle after that. I didn't care. So God healed me. Uh, and I will say, in later years, I mean, we've been married for almost 18 years, um, my family adores her. Um, so, the, so I guess I made the right choice. And you... <laughs> she, 
Bunker Bob made the right choice, yes. And Maria jumped the right fence. <laughs> so God healed me as I... God healed me as I was delivered from greed, not financially rich. I wouldn't say I'm financially rich if one were to look at the numbers that I was taught when I was seven years old. But let me tell you, I am rich in a way that I'm abundantly blessed. Amen. I'm going to tell you a story. Many of you know that Marie and I, we pray seven days a week in the morning when we wake up, and before we go to bed. And, you know, we're, uh, after that tonight, you know, we do the administrative things. We'll go home. We pray. And we say the same thing. We always pray for peace, love, and joy in our house and in our marriage. And that God is the center. We pray for that. What does it mean when we pray for that? It means we ask for it. And when God gives it, we receive it. That's right. And we receive it in our hearts. Right? Okay, so I have a beautiful, loving wife. Um, I have a successful business that survived the pandemic. I thought it was good. <laughs> this is, I thought that my business was going to close July 1, but we just smoothed from June into July. I don't know how it happened, but um, that's God. Um, God has allowed me to speak to the nations for five years and win an award for it. Um, there's just, I could go through the list. I'm not going to waste the time on it. Uh, but picture it. I'm as happy as a seagull on the beach with a French fry. <laughs> I'm so excited for life. So let me tell you, I was finally delivered from greed. What is on my skin is not important. What is in my heart is important. What people see on the outside is not important. What I feel on the inside is important because I have to carry it. The world outside is not important. The inner peace, love, and joy is important. Now let's talk about being rich. You can't buy with money peace, love, and joy. That being said, I feel rich. My wife feels rich. So now that we've discussed this a little bit, let's go a little bit further. Can I go a little bit further? Take more laundry off the sofa, sit down. <laughs> the Bible explains... The Bible explains that it's not that the rich abandon God, but becoming wealthy raises the possibility. I'm going to say that again because that's deep. Remember I said greed is the doorstep to death. The Bible explains that it is not the rich that abandon God, but becoming wealthy raises the possibility. What do I mean by possibility? That shows the risk is temptation. See, there is temptation. What happens with sin? What's the beginning of sin? It's the temptation. We learned that at the Garden of Eden. So wherever there's sin, there was a temptation that occurred first. And if you succumb to the temptation, what does that mean? It means that there's a weakness. Where does that weakness come from? Not knowing the Bible. Not walking with the Lord. Not praying. Not fasting. We've talked about that, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to Talk about that a, another day. So with wealth comes a t temptation to trust in oneself rather than the Lord. And that's what happened to me in Boston. I was trusting on my own abilities. I was alone. And where did that find me? On the floor of a command center, nearly killing myself. Eating cheap canned food unheeded. The rich sometimes feel that they have no need for God. And I can say that because I felt like that. They've made other arrangements. They solved their own problems. See, material things is, is as a threat to devotion to God as it's underscored. For example, in Deuteronomy 
chapter 8, verse 12 through 14, it warns those entering the promised land not to allow their prosperity lead them to abandon the Lord. So I'll read from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 12 through 14. And the scripture reads, When you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You forget. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 12 through 14. See, the Bible underscores love, trust, and service. Did you hear me say that? Love, trust, and service. Greedy people don't think about that. See, the Bible tells us about love, trust, and service as three core responses of the believer in relation to God and faults both the idolater, the person who commits idolatry, and the greedy person for foolishly misdirecting those away from love, trust, and service. Those that are in idolatry and those who are greedy set their hearts on inappropriate objects or inappropriate concepts. They rely on, they trust in, and they look to their treasures, their material things for protection and, and what they be, feel are blessings. They, they both serve and submit to the things that demean rather than worship the Lord. They forget. See, Jesus warns about excessive love of wealth and a forbidden service of wealth. And what, what Jesus says, no one can be loyal servant f- to two masters. You can't serve the Lord and love money. It doesn't work. Choose one. And I hope you choose the right one. And Jesus continues to say, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot faithfully serve both God and money. And that's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. That being said... Is greed a religion? Is greed a religion? And if we've already talked about greed as idolatry, then that means idolatry is a religion to some people. And that means they worship it. People worship idolatry. It does seem that for many people, material things hold the place in their lives that was once occupied by God at one time, through our innocence when we were born. But as we grow, and I told you what happened with me when I was seven years old. I remember the conversation. It wasn't just, I remember it because the conversation happened multiple times, and I remember the year. Okay, greed is idolatry in that, like, literal worship of idols. That's why... Uh, it's the doorstep to death. It represents an attack on God's exclusive rights to human love, trust, and service. We talked about that before, love, trust, and service. Material things can replace God in the human heart and set us on a course that is opposed to him. Let's talk more about this. You know, I'm going to be talking, uh, you know, with what I do sort of the day job. I'll be giving a State of the World Address on October 18th. Uh, of this year, and one of the things we're going to talk about is that economists may recommend greed, politicians rely on it, and uh, celebrities flaunt it, but in the end, all idols, for all idol money, fails to deliver on its promises. It failed for me. If the root cause of materialism is misdirected, religious impulses, then the ultimate solution is still faith in the true and living God who alone gives the security and satisfaction that each of us craves. It's simple, guys. It's simple. If your heart is empty, I agree it's got to be filled. Don't make the wrong choices. So here's a story about greed from false doctrine. Uh, This is a story about how we forget the people and care more about material things. Unfortunately, we're taught uh, material things are good and our actions show it. False doctrine teaches us that. So I, I met this guy in the street. Um, I'm going to change the story. I'm going to like it. I, I'm going to do, do the bit with Pastor Jose. Pastor Jose met this guy in the beach, uh, uh, on the street. Hey, my friend, how come you look uh, like the whole world has caved in? The sad guy says, let me tell you, three weeks ago, an uncle died and left me $50,000. <gasps> Pastor Jose, so, so sorry about your uncle. He said, hold on. 
I'm just getting started. Two weeks ago, a cousin I never knew kicked a bucket and left me $95,000 tax-free to boot. Oh, my. And Pastor Jose says, oh, sorry about your cousin. Then the man says, hey, last week, my grandfather passed away, too. I inherited almost a million. Then Pastor Jose said, oh, sorry about your grandfather. Are you still sad? And he says, yeah, this week, nothing. (laughs) (laughs) It's a story where we forget the people and care more about material things. Unfortunately, we are taught material... It is. Unfortunately, we are taught material things are good and our actions show it. Again, we see it in false doctrine in the churches. So let's learn about, I'm going to talk to you about, I told you I'm going to talk about 1st of Timothy chapter 6. The first thing I'm going to, I'm going to sort of summarize it. I I want to sort of in layman's terms um, talk about uh, what fr- uh, this chapter is all about, chapter 6 of First of Timothy, and then I'll read a piece of it that relates to my chat with you tonight. So First of Timothy, chapter 6, it outlines the duties of Christians and their beliefs, and it also pertains to other masters. It speaks of godliness and contentment. It contains a solemn demand for Timothy to be faithful. Because one of the things that the Apostle Paul, was, when he was talking to Timothy, Timothy had to be faithful because Timothy was going to be working with people who are lost. So if Timothy succumbs to what's happening in the congregation, then the whole church is lost. So what happened was the Apostle Paul was teaching Timothy to set the example. So with that example, then the church won't get lost. That that was the idea, okay? So here's a basic summary. So... I'm going to be talking about 1st of Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 21. And then after I sort of give a summary, then I'm going to read a piece of it. Okay, so chap, verse uh, 1 and 2, slavery was part of the Roman world. Believing slaves had a responsibility and a testimony to their unbelieving and believing masters. So there was a discussion about slavery. In uh, verse 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul warns against those who reject sound teaching from Jesus and also his own teaching that bring about godliness. And then in verse 6 through 10, the Apostle Paul continues by saying that godliness yields greater gain than money and the love of which brings much evil. That's, that's the issue about greed. We're going to be talking about that. Then in verse 11 through 16, the Apostle Paul then reminds Timothy to stay away from greed and instead fight the fight of faith, fight the good fight, right? Hold to eternal life and keep the commandment until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the time God the Father chooses. So in, in verse 11 through 16, the Apostle Paul was telling Tim, just hang on. That, that's what it, just hang on. And in verse 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul continues with more instructions about money. It is not to be the hope in life, but simply supplied by God to some for enjoyment and good works. The Apostle Paul concludes by, uh, in verse 20 through 21. Uh, by leaving Timothy with two challenges, guard what God has entrusted him, and to stay out of useless arguments. So that way he's not distracted, okay? So now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be reading the scripture, okay? And this is very important. And and with what I've talked about so far, now as I read it from the NIV, it'll make sense. So if you're physically able, please rise and stand in reverence to the Lord in the house of the Lord. Uh, I'll talk about Aaron Greed. This is 1st of Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 10. I'm just going to read uh, verse 3 through 10, okay? Okay, so here it is, verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, will we be content with that? Those who want to get rich fall into temptation 
and trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into the ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Um, what we're talking about is to avoid the pitfalls of the riches. And this is in 1st of Timothy chapter 6. See, it has been said there are three things that will get a preacher, wealth, wine, and woman. Paul's letter to Timothy is to warn him about the pitfalls of wealth, but it also points to one of the common traits that seem to characterize many false teachers, the inordinate focus upon wealth. Simply put, greed. Greed. From the outset, let us just agree. Let us just agree that there's no spiritual virtue that is associated with poverty. Does anyone want poverty? When I was sleeping on the floor of the command center in Westboro, Massachusetts, nah, that wasn't good. Nope, nope. There's no inherent, uh, it is not a sin to be wealthy. Let, let me tell you, Abraham was wealthy, David was wealthy, Solomon was wealthy, Lydia, Philemon, and other godly people in the scripture were wealthy. The issue has to do with the temptation. See, see, if we follow the light, if we follow the light that the Lord has given us, not the light from the ceiling, but the light that the Lord has given us, and we follow that to lead us out of darkness, then we can have the peace, calm, and joy in our life that God has intended. As I said before, the problem is not with having the wealth. That's fine. That's fine. The problem is making wealth the goal or aim of our life, like I did in Boston. I did. I did. It is not a problem when we possess wealth, but it becomes a problem when wealth possess, possesses us. Wealth is a distraction turning us away from good. You know, if I was focused on wealth, if I was focused on greed, I would not have peace, love, and joy in my house. I would not have a beautiful wife to, go, to, to be with for 18 years counting and counting. Wealth is a distraction turning us away. It is not a problem that we possess wealth, but it's a problem when wealth possesses us. That's the difference. I'm going to say it again. It is not a problem when we possess wealth, but it's, it becomes a problem when wealth possesses us. Wealth has turned some ministries into a factory of false teachings. Let this be a warning sign. Let this be a warning sign. So I'm going to tell you about the three things about false teachings. Where are the false teachings? The churches that are closing. Those, those are the ones. Okay, so let's talk about that. Three things. First one, false teachings do not agree with sound words. Simple as that. They don't agree with sound uh, words. False teaching is usually based on a half-truth or an incomplete truth. And it may tickle the ears of those who don't read Bible. Therefore, their words cannot be sound. It could be false understanding about salvation, say that salvation comes from work instead of by the grace through faith, or that salvation can come through faith plus works, or as others believe, you must be baptized in order to be fully saved. It's through Jesus. It's through your faith. And it's following the principles that we learn in the Bible. Number two, false teachings do not agree with the words of Jesus. If Jesus didn't say it, and you say Jesus said it, that's wrong. False teachers will often use the words of Jesus, but take them out of context, twist them, distort them, and spin them to fit their own personal agenda. One of the ways we can identify false teachers is by comparing what they say to what the Scripture says. See, there it is. There it is. He's holding it. Um, so if what they say does not line up with Scripture, then their teaching is false. False teaching, the third one. False teachings do not lead to godliness. See, Scripture and the Word of God leads you to God. The false teachings lead you to something other than God. I'll leave it at that. It leads you to sin. It leads you to temptation because you're not being led. False, teacher, false teachers cause fierce division. What is division? We've heard about that before. What do, we, what do I mean when I say division? Division is a sense of confusion. And with confusion, there's a behavioral response for that. And that's why you, he, you hear about the strife in a lot of homes today. Okay? And so here's, here's what happens. There's a variety of things that happen. 
and there's five of them. Number one, envy. Envy. That's the inward discontent arising from the desire to have what belongs to another. I want that. I don't care about you. I want what you have. I don't want you to have it. That's envy. Number two, that's strife and discord. This is the ugly one. I don't like this one. This is the forgetfulness, the hunger, the pain, the battle, the fights, the murders, the killings, the quarrels, the lies, the disputes, the lawlessness, and the ruin. All of that. It's the, everything you would see in a Mad Max movie. That's what strife and discord is. Number three, the abuse of language. The language. Literally, the word is blasphemies. In this case, not blaspheming God, but one another. False teachers get people talking about each other, gossiping, spreading tales, telling lies. That's what I'm talking about. Number four, the evil suspicions, calling one another's motives into question. That means not having trust. And number five, that constant friction. This is the state of being where false teachers are not confronted. I guess maybe I'm a little bit older, so I don't mind. (laughs) False teachers are the victims of greed because they just went down the wrong path. Why? They're deceived into believing that God will make them material rich. And that's what happens in a lot of false churches today. It's all about money. Number two, it's the earthly focus. They're deceived into making earth their home instead of heaven. So there's no thought about salvation. Number three, those who desire is uh, it's money. And honestly, believing that money will bring them happiness. Because they have the emptiness inside, and they feel that wealth will fill. That's a mistake. It's because they haven't thought that there's something else even better. The Holy Spirit. The gift 2,000 years ago given to us. But will not. Greed, competition, and family. Number four. There's a false sense of ownership. Let me explain that. I'm going to explain that. They are deceived uh, 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 as to who owns who. Okay? Jesus taught that money is one of the spiritual powers we fight and not simply green paper of copper nickel sandwiches. Money is not something. It is someone. And as someone, it tricks us into thinking that we master it. See, we think that we are mastering greed. We think we're mastering money. You know, we hear about organizing our finances, but sometimes through greed, we do it the wrong way. When inevitably, money will master us. Money has a way of binding us into what is physical and temporal and uh, blinding us into what is spiritual and internal. It's a bit like a fly in the flypaper. The fly lands in the flypaper and says, my flypaper. When the flypaper says, my fly, and the fly is dead. It is one thing to have money. It's another for money to have you. When it does, it will kill you, just like the fly paper. So think of this. When you look at a dollar bill, and think of yourself as the fly. Hold that dollar bill in front of you. If you stick to that money like a fly to a fly paper, who wins? The paper does. Okay? So now that you know that, I hope you're smarter than the fly. (laughs) That you'll figure out that either you own the money or the money owns you. Okay? The issue of greed. False teachers in ministry are driven by greed. They're driven by greed. Their focus is to tickle the ears, to draw an audience. Idolatry. Idolatry is the worship of an idol or a cult image. Being a physical element, such as a statue or a person in place of God, it's the worship of something or someone other than God. That's just idolatry. Okay, so let me tell you about a story. I'm going to lighten it up a little bit. We're going to talk about a story about greed. And there's a reason why I'm telling you about this, this story. Okay, so this rich yuppie, it's at night. It's hard to see. It's at night. So he's driving this really fancy BMW, this Beamer. Okay, uh, go with the heckling crowd off to the side over here, Pastor Millie. We're going to go with Mercedes. So this rich yuppie is driving this Mercedes, 
And then all of a sudden, this big truck, what kind of a truck, Pastor Melly? Okay, a, a, a big truck. <laughs> so the big truck comes by, and it just it rips the door off of the Mercedes. Of the B- <laughs> when the police arrive, the police arrive, and the police is walking up to this Mercedes with the door ripped off. It's like this. And he sees the door ripped off the car. And the rich kid says, Officer, look at what they have done to my BMW Mercedes. My Beamer Mercedes. And the police officer says, you yuppies are so materialistic. You make me sick, said the officer. You're so worried about your stupid BMW that you didn't even notice that your left arm was ripped off. Now here. Here. Now here. Here. And so here's what the rich kid says. He says, oh, oh. And he looks at his arm. Oh, where's my Rolex watch? (laughs) There's a reason why I told you that story. Let's understand greed in a secular way and what the mindset is like. Many greedy people obsessively pursue wealth as a substitute for what they feel is lacking inside of them. I, I will. I will. Um, let, uh, we're, many greedy people obsessively pursue wealth, as I did, uh, as a substitute for what they feel is lacking, that emptiness inside of them, right? But they ignore the high price that comes from greediness. And what is that? A stunted life. You, you don't grow. See, materialistic pursuits are often an attempt at relieving emotional discomfort. In fact, the behavior of greedy people can be compared to that of substance abusers. It's an addiction. But just like drugs, material possessions can never provide the comfort and reassurance we all crave. On the contrary, the greedier the greedier we become, the more we advance on the path of self-destruction. Unfortunately, amid our busyness, of the day, we rarely stop to ask ourselves, why am I frantically pursuing wealth? Why am I doing that? And I believe that's what I finally figured out. When I was sleeping on the floor, nearly killing myself, committing suicide, I asked myself, is this worth it? And God gave me a good answer. Now, I didn't know God was helping me, but I was helped. You know, on that day, I have a twin sister. Some people know I have a twin sister. Um, she tried to call me on a, a weekend when I was sleeping on the floor. And for some reason, she knew something was wrong. And uh, she drove up with her three boys and her husband. They interrupted their day, and they drove up. And they arrived at the command center. I had gone back, left, and when I came back, I had to look. I couldn't see because, you know, with all the alcohol, my eyes were, my vision was shot. But I couldn't believe it. Um, th- this is in Westboro, Mass. And w- in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, my twin sister packed up her whole family and came up to see what was up with me. And they took me out to... Um, uh, a restaurant, and then I realized that there was value that was other than money. And I, that, that, was, that was the turning point. Um, so um, materialistic pursuits are often designed to relieve an emotional discomfort. In fact, the behavior of greedy people can be compared to substance abusers, as I said. See, greed is not so much of a financial issue. It is the symptom of a troubled mind trying to link self-worth to financial worth usually on a subconscious level, in a way that you'd miss it. I I missed it. Far too often, greed comes with stress, exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and despair. All the things that I went through. Many view greed and its 
related traits such as ambition and material success as desirable rather than the potential of, mental, uh, of a mental health problem. It's not always easy to explain the harm caused by excessive greed. How, the harm can be very extent. You could be dead. Um, now, when I just said that phrase just a second ago, I realized when I say you could be dead, a lot of people probably don't understand that. But if you've ever went through that notion, as I said before, that greed is the doorstep of death, you'll understand what I'm saying if you actually stood on that doorstep. And when you stand on that doorstep, on the action, camera one on the feet, if I could go either way, I could just lean forward or lean back. It's a 50-50 shot. God had my back. I said before, greed is idolatry. Greed is an excessive love or desire for money or any possession. I really had it. I was programmed for it. I mean, when you learn what I learned at seven years old, perhaps even before when I was six, I was programmed for that mindset. Greed is not merely caring about money and possessions, but caring too much about them. The greedy person is too attached to his things and his money, or he desires more money and more things in an excessive way. I'll tell you how, how far recovered, if I want to call it that, delivered that I am. Marie and I, um, before coming here today, we went to a Belize auto shop. Um, Maria's car was damaged recently. Actually, in a recent teaching, I told the story of that. Um, well, the car is back. Um, we don't own cars. We lease them. I don't want... When you die and go to heaven, you're not taking the car with you. Um, I don't own a house. I lease a house. And the peace, calm, and joy that's in that house is of great value. You can't buy it. I'd love to see a real estate agent say, I'll sell you peace, love, and joy. And it just won't happen. Now, granted, I have the benefit because I run an international business there. I can write off a lot of the lease. So God has taken care of me. But um, I no longer have that obsession of what car to own what car to buy. The nice thing about leasing cars, in, in September 29th, we'll have two new ones. Um, <laughs> and so um, God takes care of you. You don't need to have that possession. Um, so there's a repentance for correction away from greed, and I'm going to talk about that. There's a way to fix greed. I'm about to tell you this, but I pause before I tell you this for a reason. What I'm about to tell you means nothing if you're not having the Lord with you. If, if you're just doing this, just say, I'll do this step and that step and that step. Without the Lord, it means nothing. Because in any procedure or any principles, as we talk about in the Bible, if the Lord isn't with you, and it doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't want to be with you. The Lord does want to be with you. You have to accept him in your heart, not next to you, but in your heart. Then the principles and teachings that we share every Wednesday night and pastor with you Sundays, that it'll all make sense, and then we can apply it in our lives. Okay? Number one, believers must consciously realize that the Lord owns everything they have. I'm not going to own a house. I'm not telling you not to own a house. Every situation is different, but I've made a choice because I've been delivered from the doorstep of death. So be when you're on that doorstep of death, I'm going to make decisions perhaps a little bit different, but everyone's situation is different. Okay? Um, they are merely stewards of their possessions. That's all we do. We take care of the house that we've been leasing. In September, we will have been there for 17 years. Why are we there for 17 years? Because we have peace, calm, and joy. We've asked the Lord to be in our house. You can't buy that. You ask for it. Number two, believers should cultivate a thankful heart. 
I told you before, my beautiful wife and I, we pray every morning, every evening, um, seven days a week. We give thanks to the Lord. We thank, we'll thank uh, the Lord for what has happened tonight. We'll thank the Lord for having this church family here and also watching. Uh, number two, believers must uh, cultivate a thankful heart. We talked about that. Number three, believers must learn to distinguish between wants and needs. What do you want and what do you need? There's a lot of things I want. I think, who was I telling? I think it was Bunker Bob. As I, We've learned his name, Bunker Bob. Uh, Minister Wayne. Um, I would love to be on the coast of Italy on a boat having Earl Grey tea with my beautiful wife. Uh, with what's been going on in the world, I will not be doing that this year. But that's a want. That's a want, and it's a good want. But what I need is to be savvy with certain decisions. The ease of buying things on credit has become a severe temptation. We have instruments in our lives that allow temptation. Credit cards are one of them. As a result, many people are hopelessly mirrored in debt that they will never get out unless they have a plan. The next one, believers must give sacrificially to the Lord. Laying up the treasure in heaven for the work of the kingdom should be their highest joy and the source of their greatest reward. Marie and I are always excited to come to church. It's not the building that we care about. I love the building. We come here early. Marie is excited. We've got to get there early. I've got to mop the floor. Got to make it smell pretty. Does all of that because we want the peace, love, and joy that we have in your homes. We're not selfish. We pray for you. We don't pray for ourselves. We pray for you. Maria makes phone calls, a lot of them, to many of you. You've perhaps talked to her for for, uh, quite a bit. Um, the more you give, surprisingly, you receive. Tonight, we were talking about First of Timothy, chapter 6, verse 3 through 10. We were talking about greed. We were t- understanding greed. We were, avoiding, we were talking about avoiding the pitfalls of the riches. We were talking about three things about false teachings and about the fierce divisions that are caused. We were also talking about how false teachers are the victims of greed. The issue of greed is idolatry. And then we just wrapped up talking about repentance for correction away from greed. These are the things that we talked about. I remind you that the doorstep to death caused by greed is addiction, suicide, and homelessness. And again, I share the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. one 800 273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. 273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. Again, the Bravehearted Men's Ministry Extravaganza. Your identity is your God-given purpose, and that's on Friday, September 18th, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Again, Friday, September 18th, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., and I have no idea how much that fence will cost. <laughs> my, my name is David Ewan, heading up the Bravehearted Ministry at 1060 Worcester Street. You can like us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can subscribe to us at Red Sense Spring on YouTube. We're at the kradio.com, resurrectioncenterradio.com, and we're also on ktv.us. Join us Sundays at noon and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.